I'll um, proceed like, uh, uh, without the mic for the moment. Um, my name is Brian Quirt. I, uh, uh, I live here, in fact, very near to here. This is my neighborhood. Uh, my office at Night Swimming is just over in the distillery district. So for those of you who have traveled here, welcome to Toronto uh, and to my neighborhood. Uh, I am the artistic director of Night Swimming, a commissioning company here in Toronto. I am also the um, director of the Banff Center uh, Playwrights Lab, and the board chair and uh, past president of LMDA, and also the board chair of uh, Spiderweb Show. And uh, it is a real great pleasure to have all of you here in Toronto and to have LMDA back in Toronto after 11 years. Uh, and an interesting statistic, the previous Toronto conference was also 11 years before that. So I look forward to seeing all of you again in 2029, <laughs> probably back here in this neighborhood, which would be very convenient for me. So uh, that gives, us, gives me something to live for. Um, uh, he, his, just so you know. Um, I also wanted to thank um, Phelan uh, for um, uh, the land acknowledgement that she offered. And, and she offered much more than that, actually, this morning, both in her session, but in, in her introduction, in her land acknowledgement. Uh, which I thought was um, uh, uh, fantastic and uh, apt and beautiful and a wonderful way to begin our um, sessions uh, over the next couple of days. I also want to um, acknowledge and thank um, uh, and say how impressed I've been by the Joanna and the Programming Committee based on what I've experienced here today already in the sessions that I've attended. Congratulations to all of you and particularly to Joanna and the committee that put this together. Um, uh, having. Uh, um, uh, run these before myself. I know exactly what's entailed, uh, and I've had an extraordinarily um, productive and thoughtful experience in the sessions that I've attended so far. Um, we're here uh, to end today to talk about and to hear about the Bly Creative Capacity Grant Program in its fourth year. Um, we have five extraordinary dramaturgs who have been the recipients of grants through the program um, uh, over the course of the last season. And we're gonna hear from each of them about each of their projects. Um, and uh, Mark, at the uh, end of our line over here, will also speak at, at, towards the end about kind of an overview uh, of the four years of, of this program. Um, and uh, what really has been for him and for a number of us who've been on the committee that have managed and established and adjudicated the grant over the past four years, it's really been a six year journey, I guess, Mark, perhaps longer even, um, from uh, the conception of this granting program, which I'll describe for those who, who are not familiar with it in a moment. Um, but really six years since it, it was um, imagined, I guess is the best word, by Mark and others, um, discussed at length through LMDA, <laughs> Um, uh, established, um, launched, um, uh, and then adjudicated through four rounds of grant proposals and a total of 16 grants that LMDA has been able to offer through this program over the last four years. And um, before I go any farther, I want to acknowledge and express an enormous um, thanks from LMDA and from our communities to Mark Bly, who's sitting here at the end, for the vision that he had to... Indeed, I don't, even need to, I don't even need to finish the sentence, Mark, that, that everyone uh, um, uh, here and um, so many parts of our community at LMDA and the dramaturgical worlds beyond in both of our countries um, uh, have an awareness of both of your work, but really about what this grant offered. So for those of you who are not familiar with it, um, the, the Bly Creative Capacity Grant, uh, and I'll only speak briefly about it, Mark may elaborate at the end, uh, was conceived as a way to uh, as Mark has said, uh, to infuse some oxygen into our um, uh, landscape, into our world, to uh, um, highlight uh, um, and fund projects that were expanding, exploring, shifting the boundaries of dramaturgical practice. And it, it was a, a remarkable complement to the other awards that LMDA offers uh, each year, um, which you'll hear more about uh, later in the week and at the banquet on the weekend. Um, and funded by Mark, uh, imagined and funded by Mark to the tune of more than $100,000 over the past four years. We've been able to use that $100,000 to offer grants uh, uh, um, or grants each year between twenty-five dollars and $30,000 to do exactly what Mark imagined, which was to offer um, dramaturgs and projects driven by dramaturgs the funding to realize something that they probably would never have been able to 
accomplish uh, without this sort of funding, or certainly not on the time frame that um, the grant has made possible. Um, there's only two people I'd like to uh, acknowledge in addition um, who have been a huge part of this and have worked very closely with me on it. I've had the pleasure of being on that original committee that helped establish this and have been on the adjudication committee for the four years. Um, one is Liz Engelman, who many of you know, past president of LMDA, who's been on the committee since the beginning and then worked very closely with me in terms of de devising and drafting um, the guidelines for this uh, grant and has been on the adjudication throughout. Liz is not here uh, this week, unfortunately, but a huge thank you to Liz for all of her work over the past five years. And Cindy Sorrell, who uh, is here, um, and Cindy has been uh, fundamental to this um, program, to the idea of it, to founding it, to the original conversations with Mark more than six years ago, uh, and uh, chaired the committee that adjudicated it uh, over the first two years, and has since been um, uh, working towards, there you are, Cindy, um, towards documenting uh, and capturing the impact of these grants as they complete and so that we can have a sense of, of just what the repercussions and reverberations and waves of these are as they move into the future. So a huge thank you, Cindy, thank you from all of us at LMDA for everything you've brought to this program over the past six years. Um, and uh, another person who is here is Yvette Nolan, who's been an adjudicator for the last two years. I don't know if Yvette, you're still in the room, but if you are, a huge thank you for joining us on that journey. Um, today, uh, we want to hear from uh, the recipients of this year's grant, grant grants. Uh, we were able to give out five, which has been fantastic. Um, we have Mia Amir here from Vancouver. I was going to go alphabetically, now you've switched it on me, and I didn't, I didn't catch that. Uh, Amy Brooks, you just put up your hand, <laughs> from Kentucky. Uh, Rose Osler in the middle, from San Francisco. Um, uh, Hannah Ratner here from DC. And uh, beside Mark, we have oh, Haley. Haley Nelson from <laughs> Dallas, thank you. Um, uh, it's wonderful to have you all here, both um, because you're all together and also so that Mark and I and everyone else can meet you because we've met you through your applications yeah. and to meet you in person now is, is a wonderful uh, full circle moment. Um, what I'm going to ask each of our recipients is to uh, take about 10 minutes to speak uh, to the idea that they proposed, where it's at now um, and where it's heading in the coming months because many of these projects are at the very early stage of, of, of their process uh, and we are dramaturgs and uh, process is everything. We heard that in the session that I was just part of. Um, so we're getting a snapshot of where it is and where it's heading, and uh, we will look forward in future conferences and in future opportunities to hear where each of these projects um, ultimately leads and lands. So um, I think we are ready to begin. I'm going to start alphabetically, which conveniently <laughs> is here with Mia, and if you want to introduce yourself and take it on. Great. Um, first of all, I want to extend great gratitude. Um, I'm really honored to be part of the crew of people who've received these grants and um, extend great gratitude to everyone who's been part of the process of making it happen. My name is Mia Susan Amir. I was born in Ramat Gan, Israel, occupied Palestine. I've lived most of my life on the unceded and occupied territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples, which is where I live and work now. Um, I am a Jew of mixed Ashkenazi and Sephardic descent. I am disabled by chronic illness. And those are things that are important to the project that I proposed. Um, I want to acknowledge that we've been in seats all day. <laughs> uh, and if your body has other needs while I'm speaking, it won't be an offense to me if you get up and move around. Um, I want to normalize different ways of listening and being together uh, as part of the next 10 minutes that I have. Um, this project comes from my own uh, kind of deep longing, need, and confrontation with uh, mainstream theater and my kind of the barriers that I've confronted as a disabled artist and trying to find my way in. Uh, it also comes from long term relationships and collaborations uh, with a number of people. All of the questions that I'm seeking to ask are probably not the right questions, first of all, and those questions will be redefined through the actual work of the grant, but they are possible because of the relationships that have informed um, my, my practice as a whole. And two people in particular, uh, Crystal Smith and Toysanat Cease Weiss, have been really integral to, um, to this work, and I want to acknowledge them they're not here, 
there in Vancouver. <laughs> um, I'm going to read off pages because CRIP and Fiber Fog and uh, being real about how I'm doing. Uh, and I hope that that's going to be interesting enough. And if it's not, move around and I won't know. <laughs> <laughs> so the project that I proposed is entitled Unsettling Dramaturgy, Crip and Indigenous Process Design in the Studio, on the Stage, and in the Street. It's going to be probably an online colloquium that's going to bring together disabled and indigenous dramaturgs and some allies from across the Americas for a year-long collaborative project and programming. And the questions that um, I proposed were the following. What defines CRIP and indigenous dramaturgical practices? What are the intersections? How does centering these practices provide critical interventions to capitalist and colonial methodologies for theater making, which inform, in large part, mainstream uh, North American theater ecology? What unique innovations in representation, aesthetics, and content emerge with the application of CRIP and indigenous dramaturgical process design? How are relationships with audiences, places, bodies, his, this historic moment altered uh, through the application of these practices? How can those centering CRIP and indigenous dramaturgical process design use digital and web-based media to extend leadership and innovation? And how can these media best be used as platforms for exchange of inherently land, place, and body-based process, processes and practices? Um, and lastly, not lastly, <laughs> lastly, not lastly, how does centering these approaches reveal new conceptualizations for, or maybe dismantling of, uh, funding and institutional infrastructure required to support the creation and presentation of work by CRIP and indigenous artists, as well as opportunities to propel our leadership? So, oh, and then lastly, lastly, what is the application of all of this? to um, work, the work of grassroots movements right now. So, they're really fucking big questions. <laughs> okay. So, uh, maybe I'll start with some assumptions that I make about what dramaturgy is uh, and how that connects to this project. Yeah? Cool? Everyone okay? Yeah. Remember, you can get up. It's all good. <laughs> so, Dramaturgy, this is how I define dramaturgy, and we can talk about this. Please help me in this definitional process. I don't come from theater. I'm not trained as a dramaturg. I came from uh, community arts and community organizing, and somehow landed here in this, which is a great honor. Um, but we come from different places to this work, and so I'm interested in a variety of ways of defining our work in the world. Um, so I propose. Dramaturgy as the practice of supporting the truth of a piece of theater or political action, emerging in terms of content, aesthetics, context, and considerations around presentation. Oh, my grammar is really funny. As <laughs> is at its heart the work of inquiry. So dramaturgy at its heart is the work of inquiry. We probably agree with this. Uh, this requires that we listen deeply beyond the concept beyond the page to what lies hidden beneath. So the kind of inquiry that we as dramaturgs are able to offer to work is immediately configured by our positionality, which I define as our relationships to our society's structures of power. Our positionality shapes our perceptions of and assumptions about what the work being developed is, its creators, about the spaces and conditions within and under which the work is being created, and the land upon which the work being created is being created and presented. So we're working through our own filters and the ways that we've been socially informed to understand what we're working on based on our position and relationship to systems of power. It's just real. That's how it is. Uh, so our inquiry as dramaturgs is therefore inherently a politicized act, which has real artistic and social impact and consequence. It calls us to invest in the work of understanding what shapes our perceptions and in pushing those limitations out. So the colloquium that I'm proposing aims to drive theater forward by generating a critical platform with, which acknowledges the political nature of this work. It proposes crip and indigenous dramaturgical practices as methods through which this can be considered and 
to simultaneously reconfigure dramaturgy as an embodied and land-based practice thereby inviting us to center modalities which view the body and the land as sites of narrative production and collaborators in creation, to challenge empty vessel approaches to creation and production, which require that we leave our identities and our histories at the door of the studio or the stage, and instead centering relationships, self-determination, intervulnerability, responsibility, reciprocity, spiritual and cultural practices as core principles of creative practice. <coughs> Am I making sense? Okay, cool. Yes. So, it also asks us to engage with and transform uh, systemic and interpersonal dynamics of power towards equity as part of the work of creation and production, to trouble the ways in which hierarchical approaches to creation and production can and often do reproduce broader systems of power within our work. It's about self-reflection very deep self-reflection. It asks us to expand our understandings of and relationship to time and space in the context of creation and presentation, to shift from processes that prioritize product to approaches and aesthetics that take their lead from our physical, emotional, spiritual, and cognitive access and culture needs, and the political and socio-historical context that shape and surround our work thereby making space for artists and audiences regularly excluded from mainstream practice, I think. It also asks us to address that we make work in places that are undergoing ongoing projects of colonization, with direct violent impacts to indigenous communities first and artists, and that we often do so supported by governmental institutions or private foundations engaged in maintaining and benefiting from this colonial project. This introduces critical questions about responsibility in relationship to advocacy, resource distribution, leadership, and representation at all levels of creation and production, and attention to protocols within our work. So the work of making theater, I think, is much like the work of political change, nurturing a seedling vision of something that doesn't yet exist into existence. The inclusion of crip and indigenous dramaturgical practices in the space of our work can be viewed as prefigurative experiments connected to the discovery and eventually implementation of new social and political modes to impact change. I know it's kind of lofty, but we have to remain hopeful, I think, right now, especially about our work. Um, can I say a few more things, or sure. am I done? And we, no, where are you at at um, the moment? <laughs> Two minutes. <laughs> Two minutes? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> well, where am I at? <laughs> I'm still an ideation. Everything is still a vision. <laughs> no, I'm working on crib time. So I've been involved in a creative process for the last six months that taught me that I can only do one thing at a time if I want to do anything in the world that is meaningful. And the consequences of trying to do more than that have been very deep. And so this is, uh, there have been conversations that have been had with many possible collaborators. Uh, this work will begin in the fall, um, and I can tell you some of the things that I'm planning to do, should I? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, and I wanted to mention too, if you feel compelled by any of this, I am looking for more people to participate in this online colloquium. So I would love to talk to you, uh, exchange contact information, and to find ways to connect um, over the next couple of months as things are coming together. Okay, so a couple of things that may happen that I think are cool. Um, Praxis presentations, so these are uh, monthly performance lecture series uh, featuring collaborating art artists. Unsettling discussions, so these are di this is a dialogue series featuring collaborating artists engaging in the most difficult questions at the intersection of crip and indigenous dramaturgical practice. Practice space, which is a potentially uh, monthly uh, chat room, training group, open to the public, facilitated by myself and a collaborating artist in approaches to crip and indigenous dramaturgical practices, and a knowledge exchange, which is um, a library where all of these things will live for eternity, or until the internet has dissolved. <laughs> <laughs> At which point, they won't be relevant anymore, because we probably won't be on Earth. Um, that's it. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks.
Thanks, Mia. The Bly grants are a very patient grant program as well. So <laughs> the fact that you, you know you will the, the the activities will take off in the fall and continue into the subsequent years is in fact part of our interest, knowing that projects take time. In fact, oh, yeah. we talked to one of the recipients yeah. um, uh, uh, earlier today who was saying four years, from the first year, four years later, only now is the sense of the impact of mm -hmm. um, the outcomes of that project that we funded four years ago really coming to the fore in a way that can be articulated. So, totally understood. <laughs> Amy. But you've got to keep it iterative during those four years. I think that's the trick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, RFBQ, really fucking big questions, y'all. <laughs> Church. All right. Uh, my name is Amy Brooks. She, her, hers. And I also am going to refer to my notes now and again. I'm just 41 and tired. <laughs> and if I don't keep to my notes, I'm just going to end up talking about the new season of One Day at a Time, or the Minneapolis Raccoon, uh, which, if you don't know about the Minneapolis Raccoon, Google it. It's the great drama of our time. <laughs> okay, so I want to start uh, by telling you a little bit about uh, my theater, which we're loosely calling a theater uh, project called Theater Building Community. Uh, and then I want to use a little bit of time to uh, just hang that work around a little bit of philosophy asking why community-based and grassroots arts, and why that might be attractive or useful to you and us as dramaturgs. So uh, I want to begin, too, by acknowledging my colleagues in this project. This is not my work alone, not even close. All of our language, all of our labor, and all of our love uh, in the grant proposal that I put forward to the Bly panel uh, contained language from uh, my artistic director, Dudley Cock, uh, from the head of Apple Shop's organizing wing, and uh, the Letcher County Culture Hub, who I'll tell you a little bit more about in a moment, Ben Fink, and um, Bob Leonard, who uh, was the artistic director of the Late Great Road Company, based in Johnson City, Tennessee, and is now uh, the head of the directing program at Virginia Tech. Three institutional dramaturgs working together to ask how uh, arts and culture can drive Equitable development in communities with histories of economic exploitation. That, that's really a mouthful. But, uh, so I work at Apple Shop, which is an Appalachian arts and humanities institution based in Whitesburg, Kentucky. And uh, it was started in 1969 as part of Lyndon Johnson's War on Poverty. And today it has 24-7 uh, um, streaming uh, radio station, WMMT-FM. It has a record label, June Apple Records. It's got a youth documentary <coughs> film training program, Appalachian Media Institute. And it has uh, a theater wing, which is Roadside. Um, since 1975, Roadside Theater has used uh, story circles as a tool for building empathy and communication and making new um, place-based and culturally specific <coughs> plays among uh, working class and poor rural and urban communities and people. And uh, a few years ago, oh, I just got better. <laughs> Way better, now I can hear myself. Uh, a few years ago, um, uh, out of one of these community-based playmaking projects, using story circles as a tool, uh, an organizing project called the Letcher County Culture Hub arose. And today the Letcher County Culture Hub, oh, thank you. Okay, is this working better? Do I need to be under a boom or? No, just it should not be. Under track. Like, no. Oh, yeah. I Do you want to switch for that? Out? I don't know. Let's try. If I get closer, does this help? Is that yeah. Okay, cool. We'll just play a musical chair. It's <laughs> End of the day. We gotta float fast and loose. That's how we organize. Okay. Keep, keep the mic nice and close. All right, nice and close. Okay. Close to my mouth. Yeah. All right. Uh, just uh, hold up an arm or something if you're having trouble hearing me, and I'll go to ask for help. Okay, cool. So the Letcher County Culture Hub today is... <laughs> the Letcher County Culture Hub today is uh, a loosely knit coalition of like 19 for and non-profit uh, community organizations, government organizations, uh, fire stations, farmers markets, and all different sorts of people in Letcher County, Kentucky working together to improve their community. We work with uh, Roadside Theater, 
So my organization, Roadside Theater, works with Electric County Culture Hub um, right now to use arts and culture to help drive these questions of economic development. All right, so that is the basis for um, the way that arts and culture are coming together with organizing in Central Appalachia. Sorry, I'm a little thrown now from all the commotion. Um, Brian, I, I think we can hear without the mic. Yeah. yeah. It's really yeah. distracting. It's cutting in and out. If you're, so. if you're cool, if you can hear it, great. Yep. Yeah. Can we? Yep. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right, groovy tunes. Um, Ramona, will it wreck the video if I step forward a little bit? Because I'm just, I felt very planted in that chair. Okay, cool. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, a little while ago, we started uh, talking with the national partner, Imagining America, which is a coalition of about 100 colleges and universities um, using um, uh, community partnerships and relationships to help advance conversations about equity in their arts and humanities and design programs. And we started coming together, um, doing this work together. So now we are a national network. We're about to take the Letcher County-based work and take it national, which I'll tell you about in a moment. And um, we're using that question of how arts and culture can drive equitable development to coalition build in communities facing economic issues like ours across America. Recently, we've come into conversation with uh, Virginia Tech and the Virginia Tech Artworks uh, website program that is going to use projects like Theater Building Community and the Letcher County Culture Hub Roadside Partnership to model how arts and culture can kind of span disciplines and uh, work on community-based projects as part of a, a website model that will feature other projects like Talking Bands Marcella Shale Project uh, as kind of a central communications hub and a platform for public dialogue that picks up a lot of where, uh, do you, did y'all remember the Community Arts Network? Mm -hmm. That website, now defunct, it worked until, I um, think about 2010, but it was a repository for knowledge, it was a knowledge sharing platform, and a lot of our work is going to live on that, and we hope to connect to possibly other projects and other websites, like the Black <coughs> Theater Commons, and the technology that it is bringing in to really span communities and conversations, cultures, geographies, and disciplines. All right. Some of our upcoming work that I'll be doing includes uh, an organizing trip to Uniontown, Alabama to meet with Black Belt Citizens, which is a really great community organizing and advocacy group. And a lot of national partners will convene there from rural and urban places to talk about um, bringing this next stage in theater building community, or sometimes we call it performing our future, whatever you want to call it, forward. Um, I will be starting, we hope, a residency in Newport, Virginia where the Mountain Valley Pipeline is scheduled to go in directly adjacent to uh, a community center that the entire community has deeply invested in. And now the economic versus the community center uh, issue is kind of tearing that community apart. And they need uh, things like story circles and public dialogue to help them uh, solve problems together. Uh, and in Whitesburg, Kentucky, the home of Apple Shop, keep your fingers crossed for this one, y'all, because I'm so excited for it, hoping that it really happens, but it looks like it's going to. Um, uh, I have been in conversations with a partner to bring in uh, Rachel Chavkin, the original director of Natasha Pierre and the Great Comet of 1812, and some actors from National Theatre of Scotland, and uh, Rachel's uh, Brooklyn-based theatre company, The Team, into Central Appalachia, to lead a week-long devised uh, performance workshop that will be co-led by uh, Central Appalachian, Brooklyn, and Scottish artists that will help showcase the diverse uh, populations within Appalachia that are not usually visible, like our community of color, our indigenous people, our queer population, uh, to help them understand so that they can take back out into the world what diversity within Appalachia looks and sounds and feels and tastes like. So that is some of the work. Can I ask how much time I have left? You have two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. So why community-based dramaturgy? Do we have any West Virginians in the house? It was Juliana, <laughs> but she's the one that I met today. Do we have anyone who grew up in a, a house under the poverty line? We've got a couple people who come from low income. So I'm fifth generation West Virginian. And being Appalachian in American theater, uh, I came up through the mainstream. I went to all the right places. I did my internship in the right theater in my New England cohort, along with ART in Yale and Columbia uh, at UMass Amherst. And um, you know, I, I found out there that I would always kind of be a fish out of water as an Appalachian person. I would always be serving people who understood not much about the place that I'm from and uh, would be embarrassed by it. 
I would always smack faintly of white trash and um, people would expect me to be ashamed of the so-called backwardness and the contradictions and the messiness of the place that I'm from. And then I realized that I didn't know how to combat all that because I had left the place that I'm from. So I went back to Appalachia and uh, when I did that, I faced some realities about myself and I'm just gonna leave it with this. It's a metaphor that I've been evolving, all right? I've been trained to see the American theater, and please excuse me, um, Canadian people, I speak only of the American theater, not meaning to exclude, but because it's my story and my reference. So um, I've been trained to think of the American theater as something like the crown in the Statue of Liberty. Mm. All right, you take those like 354 steps, having paid the same admission price that everyone else pays, and if you put in the labor and you're resourceful and you have stamina, you get to the top, and you are in a superior platform with a great view of our culture, which is New York. <laughs> and with one eye, I still see our American theater like that, and I love it very, very much. And uh, I also am seeing what it could be. But since I came to Central Appalachia and started working with the organizers there who are always fighting for anti-racist education, for reproductive justice, healthcare and needle exchange, clean energy and environmental advocacy, and equitable economic development. Um, I've started to see it a lot more the way they do sometimes, which is as a penthouse in Trump Tower. Mm -hmm. All right, if you're people like us, you're lucky if you get to take the service elevator up. And if you get there, you're in a really amazing, rarefied, kind of gilded place with wealthy company, and uh, it's a shrine to glamour, it's a shrine to capital, and it's a place that people like us can almost never access. And if you do, and I'm going to pick out one particular show here, because I think it exemplifies some problems, um, you pay $200 to see Miss Saigon, and you're scrubbing a gold-plated toilet. And that's how most people experience the American theater. So the question is, even if I could get there to the top, what values would I have to assimilate to belong in that company? So how could I go back to where I'm from, with people doing different work, and change that status quo instead from where I am, leading with the work of the people in my own region? Mm -hmm. So that's uh, where I'm going to leave it, and I'm going to pass the mic now. <laughs> Thank you. Who's, up, who's next off of me? Do you want that? Don't. I don't know. This feels, this feels like it's more trouble than a... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, great. That works for Okay, um, well, hi, I'm Haley. Um, I, along with Kitchen Dog Theater, um, down in Dallas, Texas, received this grant. Um, so thank you to Mark, and thank you to Kitchen Dog Theater. Um, I'm really excited about this. I'm an early career dramaturg, and this is my first conference. Um, and I'm really excited because uh, this project really seems to touch on a lot of the issues that have been brought up just today. So thank you for educating me and inspiring me um, and validating me in this work. Um, dramaturgs are gifted with the ability to listen and to ease conflict, to map out problems and find solutions. We are researchers, champions, and friends. We all know this. Um, so Integrated Dramaturgy, our project, quite simply is the idea that these skills particularly suit us for community engagement as well. What happens when you put a dramaturg in charge of community engagement? Um, our project examines the impact of a dramaturg through a blend of textual and civic dramaturgy reading our community like a play, attempting to understand the basic structure of our city, the key players, what they need, what prevents them from getting it, how we can help, and in doing so, making our theaters work better, harder, and smarter for our communities. The, dramatur the dramaturgical response to reading our communities like plays would be to help make that play better, to give those characters clearer, louder voices. We believe in this way that theater should also be town halls, and to do that, we need to figure out how we can better reflect our rich, warm, diverse community in our audiences and on stage. This directly reflects Kitchen Dog's mission of justice and exploring identity and humanity through our plays. And this was the main reason we undertook this project. Another reason we wanted to tackle this project is because Dallas is a dramaturgical desert. Um, I am one of the only dramaturgs in the city and I believe I'm the only one to work in my field full time. Kitchen Dog and I believe that dramaturgy is integral to creating excellent new work and excellent new work is integral to promoting underrepresented voices. With our rapidly diversifying city, that is busting with new work, we think it is important to spread the word about dramaturgy and find budget justification for dramaturgs to do justice to those voices. We wondered if there was a way to use the unique skills dramaturgs possess and wrap them into other roles in hopes of finding funding pathways for our vital positions at theaters. In beginning this work, we had a few tools already at our disposal. So we have an existing free ticket initiative. It is called Admit All. 
um, in which we reserve uh, 20 free tickets at every show for audience members in need. Um, we also have an unfunded interactive lobby display. Um, this was something that I introduced to the theater in the 2016-2017 season. So just interactive displays in the lobby to engage audience patrons with the work as soon as they walk in. Um, we also had a, base, a baseline for um, what our audience demographic breakdown was due to demographic surveys we took a few years ago. So we used these existing tools as the starting point for our integrated dramaturgy work, um, which we began applying in January-ish uh, to our already in progress 2017-2018 season. Our goal was to use this grant and integrated dramaturgical practice to be more thoughtful and more specific with our existing community engagement work. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, we wanted to challenge ourselves to think bigger. Uh, we sought to increase our admit all ticket usage, so we had this program, but we wanted it to see capacity at every show. Uh, we wanted to prioritize lobby display development, and our much bigger goal has been to achieve parity between the people on stage, the people in the audience, and the people in our community. Uh, this is part of this lar larger civic dramaturgy work we're getting at with this project. In thinking dramaturgically about the point of parity, it seemed important to me that we focus not just on the container, but on the content. So making sure we were not just quantitatively aligned with our communities, but qualitatively. Um, if we're going to be a town hall, we need to represent not just the faces of our community, but their voices and their values. Uh, so once I unlocked this piece, the real work sort of began. Um, so the work. Uh, our grant came in the middle of our 2017-2018 season, so we really had to develop this methodology and practice it on our feet. Uh, the project is all at once very massive and very multifaceted. Um, it's very nuanced, but also it's so obvious to be doing this work. Uh, in some ways, it feels sort of like a complete system overhaul. Um, so while it was really daunting to begin, I'm glad that we're getting the ball rolling. My work so far has really been to begin it all. Um, learning what we don't know has been the name of the game. I developed a new audience demographic survey, which was included in programs in every show. Um, and I also created a community inventory survey, which was sent out um, automatically with our thank you for coming post-show emails. Uh, the first survey looked at capturing quantitative information about who our audience is overall and who's coming to each specific show. The second survey captures qualitative information about what our audience's values are um, and what communities and cultures they identify with while auditing the efficacy of our theater's mission and our community engagement tools. Um, the information collected from these surveys will be used in future engagement initiatives and also it will be informative to our season planning among other uses. I've also become the boots on the ground person and point person for, for Kitchen Dogs community engagement. Most of my work has included uh, researching and emailing local nonprofits, interest groups, clubs, and organizations, specifically aligned with our shows in order to spread the word about Admit All, um, but also to set up meetings with them and to listen to their needs, capture their narratives, um, so we can work together to advance their missions and um, get them better access to our work. I've also been putting some miles on my little station wagon. I've been driving around the massive city and getting FaceTime with these people, bringing them in all flyers, um, going to local community centers and gyms and agencies related to our shows, just trying to spread the word. I also <coughs> created um, three new show-specific interactive lobby displays this season, including our first ever New Works Festival display. Uh, that was this past month. I also was able to try some new community engagement tactics within our theater. Uh, for our world premiere musical Pompeii, we had a post-show talk back um, with experts in ecology and art that were able to directly respond to issues that the show brought up uh, within our Dallas community. Uh, our post-show panels like this were a really big success for us. We were given specific action items from these groups and experts uh, in order to help support Dallas ecology and artists, which is very true to the mission of this grant. Also true to the mission, we created a um, Bly blog on the Kitchen Dog website that has, these, yeah, <laughs> that has these action items there for the audience to look at. Um, and from these panels, we were also able to schedule a meeting with our district city council member, which uh, was huge because we're now able to continue having these dialogues with him. Um, I also received a lot of really positive feedback about our lobby displays and their ability to bridge gaps in education um, and set the tone of the show. Uh, patron feedback is that these displays made audiences feel empowered and understood, which I believe is a direct reflection of dramaturgical skills being brought to the table in this capacity. Having just completed our final show of the season, we're still crunching numbers from our surveys, but anecdotal evidence from the Kitchen Dog staff um, illustrates that admit all our free ticket program is being used more and that more people are aware of it. Um, also that many of us using admit all, or many of those using admit all are first time theater goers. Uh, if not, they're attending their first ever Kitchen Dog show, which is a big win for us. Uh, we have, of course, encountered some challenges in this work, and we're not at all done, and we're hoping to resolve these issues, and we have a long road ahead of us. Um, but one of our largest issues has simply been institutional conflict or miscommunication. 
uh, in our current temporary space, Kitchen Dog is a, uh, we're considered a homeless space or a stray space. This is a big issue in Dallas where performing companies uh, do not have reliable venues in which to perform, even including Kitchen Dog, which has a 27 year history in Dallas. Um, so in our current temporary space, there simply isn't room or money for me to physically be in the office full time. Um, so establishing new programming while working remotely has created a lot of room for miscommunication about logistical issues such as survey distribution or the priorities of admit all. Uh, we also had to, as an institution, reckon with our own conflicts. Free tickets are often in direct opposition to making money, and between introducing new, new programming and a new marketing member to our team, we have really had to clarify our need to meet the bottom line while prioritizing community initiatives. Overall, our biggest challenge has been gaining community trust in order to fulfill part of our civic dramaturgy practice. Uh, simply, we're not getting people to respond to our outreach. This le the lesson I've learned with this time and time again uh, in this project is that just because we have free tickets doesn't mean people want them. Uh, just because a theater is reaching out to the community does not mean the community assumes that we will welcome them. And just because I say I want to help does not mean that people will believe me or uh, want it or find it helpful. Uh, <laughs> what we're doing is a cultural change and this is necessary for both our community and our company and change takes time. Uh, we are listening to our community's hesitancy and just as in dramaturgy we have to remain conscious of decolonizing our community engagement processes as well. Uh, as a result I'm switching tactics slightly and we've started approaching local community leaders outside of the arts but who are already familiar with um, Kitchen Dog and its staff and we're letting them sort of introduce us softly to their communities and um, listen to their narratives in that way. So next steps uh, are pursuing this tactic change that I just discussed as well as calculating the data we received um, and planning community engagement work for the next season. Uh, I'm also planning a roundtable conversation with other community engagement leaders in Dallas Theater um, and we're hoping to discuss sort of what they're doing and, and the benefits and challenges of their specific tactics. Um, we also, as a Kitchen Dog team, um, plan to discuss some institutional changes that we can make within our own company to allow this work to flourish and continue. Um, the biggest challenge in all of this is funding, right? That's always the problem. Um, Kitchen Dog is a five-person staff, four-person staff. We're considered a mid-sized theater in Dallas. Um, <laughs> so without funding, this work may fall through the cracks, which we don't want to happen. Um, so our biggest issue right now is trying to find funding to keep this programming happening. Um, but we're very hopeful and we're very grateful um, and we're just beginning a very long journey so thanks for your support. <laughs>
scared to have, um, and whether there was a place for the kind of work that we've decided is a hard no, and what does it mean for us to, to draw a line. Um, and these aren't just questions about um, identity and representation, I'm also talking about topics um, that are off the table for some reason, um, and plays that gatekeepers have, have, for whatever reason, decided is a definitive no. Um, so we decided to do this festival, the Problematic Play Festival. And the festival is really about asking questions. Um, because I don't know if I should have humored his work, and I'm still maybe wondering that. And um, through this process, we've done um, an open submission. Um, it was, we received 167 submissions. We kind of loosely define problematic plays as um, topics that are off the table or would not otherwise be produced by other theaters. Um, and we asked people to write cover letters explaining who they were and why their play was problematic, and also submit um, the script and any rejections from other theaters. Um, so yeah, <laughs> though Neil rejected a lot of these. <laughs> so we got, yes, we got 167. No, no they didn't. <laughs> 167 eligible submissions. I will say there are also um, quite a few people who thought of problematic in terms of production that was like, there's a 30 person cast and a dragon and everyone's underwater and no one's gonna produce this. Um, and while that is also true, um, we are more interested in, um, in conversations that we're not having, perhaps. Um, and part of the cover letter was trying to figure out if these people were open to discussion, because we did receive quite a few cover letters that made me cry. Um, and then other ones where they were really asking, like, is it, o is it okay for me to tell this story, or is it okay to talk about incest in this way? Um, just to give you a sense of, like, the breakdown of the kind of work we received, um, it was a lot of, um, a lot of work about um, sexual assault or sexual violence that had different framings of um, maybe narratives that were very ambiguous, um, raising questions of whether or not to trust the victim, that sort of thing. A lot of narratives about the Holocaust, um, where they were either comedies about Nazis or um, maybe framing the Jews as bad people. Um, very, what I think was unconventional. A uh, place that either lacked a moral center or didn't have any kind of ethical message. Um, or stories about marginalized groups where the marginalized person was maybe not, not in the right. Or there was questions of whether that person was doing the right thing. Um, questions where people make mistakes, people don't apologize, and nobody learns a lesson. <laughs> that is scary shit to produce. That's scary. Um, so in this first round, um, I, we brought in a bunch of readers. We've been narrowing it down to 10 finalists. We've been evaluating these um, plays based on what kind of conversations we can have in the room. Um, so for some of them, they're maybe like good plays for whatever reason, but we don't feel like there's a conversation to be had. Um, maybe I didn't say this before. The festival itself will be a staged reading of three of the places, three of the plays, with discussions before, during, and after. <laughs> <laughs> and I like the idea of audience members like holding a sign or something that says like "shut up" or like "stop," <laughs> like that we are able to um, respond to everything that comes up in a in a very facilitated way. And the playwrights will be present in the room and must be open to discussion. Um, so it's not about like offending for the sake of offending. It's about like discussing why we are offended and what that means. Um, one question that has come up a lot just in the evaluation of these scripts is um, the difference between offensive and problematic. The difference between problematic and hurtful, problematic and harmful, um, what it means to provoke for the sake of provoking, and how identity fits into this conversation. Um, yeah, yeah. So we just um, we just narrowed it down to well, we've narrowed it down to 15, but we're trying to narrow it down to 10, and then we'll notify people of their finalist status, and then we're doing one-on-one -on -one interviews, um, and bringing in another group of readers to read the scripts to narrow it down to three, and then the actual festival will take place in October at Z Space in San Francisco, um, and. We're going to get some really kick butt director facilitators to help make this happen because I'm, I'm asking a lot of questions, but I don't have any answers and I'm not the person to answer them anyway. Um, but I am interested in seeing what kinds of conversations we can have around this. 
I think we all, as <coughs> literary managers or dramaturgs or gatekeepers in some whatever capacity, we make decisions in our head about like what's okay and what's not okay. And I think that's fine. Like I think at the end of the day, like we, <laughs> we, we have to be making those decisions, but at least for myself, I want to better understand why I am making those decisions, especially if I'm saying like, I'm the literary manager and I, I get to decide. Um, then I think I should probably figure out why. Right? <laughs> That'd be good. Um, I think that's everything I need to say about that. I was really excited about the question and answer part of this. But that'll come later. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Thank you, Rose. That's what I got. That's fantastic. <laughs> Hannah. All right, I'm going to stand up also. Yeah. Let's do it. Sitting in my ankles. Um, hi, I'm Hannah. And it is just such an honor to be here. Thank you. And hearing all of you and being with all of you and these processes and, and these structures that are being discussed, I think are really important and um, give me hope that this decision I've made to be in theater for my whole life is the right decision and will you know, lead to a continued life of theater. Um, so I guess a couple of things to know about me. Uh, I work full time for the Shakespeare Theater in Washington, D.C. as the audience enrichment manager. So I do a lot of this and <laughs> asking questions to the audience. Um, so I want to ask you all a question. If you can just you know, do a hand raise if you um, agree or if, well, I'll ask the question. <laughs> the question is, do you think that playwrights have to be writers. Is there anyone who thinks when they think playwright, they think writer? Very happy. There are a couple of like, maybe, <laughs> but no one is full out like, yeah, a playwright is a writer. So that's great. Um, because I've had for a long time this problem of the text as the ultimate piece of what makes theater. Because as we all know, theater is collaborative, theater exists in time and space, and it's not just about the words. And the playwright frequently is the genesis of the piece, but isn't always. Um, so I'm also a producing playwright with The Welders. The Welders is a playwrights collective, and since a lot of people did shout outs to their helpers to get this um, grant written, I have to do a special shout out to two of my fellow producing playwrights, Deb Spigny and Annalisa Diaz for pushing me and pushing me to do the grant um, and helping me out with it. Um, so I am a producing playwright, and when I took that title on, when I was invited to join the company, and what we are is a collective of playwrights. We produce one play from each member playwright, somewhat modeled off of 13P, but instead of dissolving at the end, we pass the whole company on to a new group of playwrights. So I'm part of the second generation of playwrights. We took over the company in 2016. And um, Woody and Sullivan will be here tomorrow as part of the first founding generation. And we are actually in the process right now of applications for the third generation. So a friend who's a playwright, who considers himself a playwright, came to me and said, we're forming a group. I think it would be great to have a dramaturg as part of this group. And started talking to me about all the ways the dramaturg could help, both with you know, dramaturging productions and dramaturging systems and all of that. And I was like, well, if I'm going to do it, I need to have a play. You know, I'm not going to become a member if I don't get my own play. Um, and then after I became one of the producing playwrights, I thought about the times that I have served as playwright in a text-based fashion. And I've had some experience with that, and I've had some experience with devising. And the challenge that I've always had with the text-based um, is, I think, the reason why I'm a dramaturg. It feels too much like my ego and my self on the stage. I listen to words that I wrote, and I sit there. Uh. Um, 
So I had to realize that what I needed to do as a producing playwright was create a piece using my skills as a dramaturg instead of using my skills as a writer. So that is what I am doing. Uh, that is the project that I have embarked on with the welders and it will be produced in November. Um, and that is soon. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so there are a few things I knew going in. I knew, given my uh, the amount of time I spent thinking about Shakespeare and classic theater and the amount of time I think about decentralizing storytelling from a white perspective to um, a range of perspectives, and I knew I was interested in what storytelling does with audience and how we create community being in the room together. So I came back to the play Pericles, Shakespeare's Pericles. How many people are familiar with Pericles? Yeah, <laughs> a lot of hands, excellent. Pericles is a crazy play. Um, it does not have a straight line through it. And there are, it's like a series of vignettes really with little bits of Shakespeare lines gone through it. And it has a narrator. And the narrator is based off of a real writer who came, who was born 400 years before, I think 400 before Shakespeare, John Gower. And this idea that Shakespeare created a play that put someone else's narrative out front, whereas usually when we look at Shakespeare's plays, we can deconstruct you know, all of the sources and all the things that he took from to create his version. This one actually says, here is the source. And that was really interesting to me because I think what I've seen with audiences and what I try to do in my day job is get people to take Shakespeare down from the pedestal and look at the play for what the play is in this moment. So I'm thinking about that. Pericles thematically is about storytelling everything is told through a lens of storytelling, the amount of time people are expressing themselves and given stage to tell their stories, um, it's, it's just very present in the text. So I'm starting with that and it's called In This Hope, A Pericles Project. And the way I'm thinking about it is that there are three layers there to people in a performance. There is the layer of who we are as individuals, our stories, our histories, what we are bringing into the room. There is the role we are playing within the parameters of the situation. You all are right now my audience, I am the speaker. And then there's the character that we put on as an actor and take on elements of to tell someone else's story. So I'm letting all three of those kind of live in the same space. I have a cast of five incredible um, female uh, um, actors who come from various countries. And among the five, there are, I think, six languages spoken, including um, a couple including three who have English as their second language. Um, and so I'm really interested in what happens when you have someone performing in their own language without translation, and especially when you're doing that with the storytelling of Shakespeare. Um, and the seating is going to be in an audience circle with the action happening all around because I want to get the audience involved from the beginning in this process of so figuring out how these steps to welcoming them in um, and then getting them to the end point of the production, which is going to be the audience finishing the story. Um, and through that, there's space for them to tell their own stories um, and 
I've been thinking a lot. I'm thinking a lot right now. That is the stage I am in. Um, I've been thinking a lot about how in Jewish tradition, when someone dies, you say, may their memory be for a blessing. And that idea that memory and story brings someone back to life in a way. And Pericles ends with Thaisa, Pericles' dead wife, being brought back to life. <coughs> So I'm thinking a lot about how we, as a community in the room, everyone there can bring the people we love into the space with us to share that with the rest of the audience, with the performers. Um, so it's a lot going on and um, I'm very excited. So right now where we are, we've got a cast, we've got a design team, got a director, and I've got a structure for rehearsal and creation um, that starts with individual conversations with the actors to talk about their stories and what about the play interests them. And that will help frame the direction that we go in. Um, it's not devised in a traditional sense. I'm not looking for them to create specific text. We're not creating new characters. It's all <coughs> gonna be within those three levels. Um, and it will use some Shakespeare text, some of my text, and then some moments of open storytelling that the actors can really just tell their stories. And one of um, the things I did in the audition process, how am I doing on, okay. What I, one of the things I did in the audition process was ask the actors to come in and teach us something. And the people I cast were the people who took us from behind the table, brought us onto the floor with them, looked us in the eyes, and taught us something that wasn't just you know, a random tidbit, but was about their personal history. Um, and that kind of, that is the experience that um, I think the skills that I have as a dramaturg can help push through, and I don't know if the end result will be a play, but it is certainly going to be a theatrical experience. <laughs> Thank you. As we uh, come to the end of this year of the fourth round of the Bly Grants, we wanted to offer Mark an opportunity to, to, to speak to the, the, the journey that we've been on, and uh, then if we have time, we'll, we'll open up to, to questions. But Mark. A uh, couple things. Um, this was fantastic. Thank you, thank you. Um, the, f the first thing, I said this earlier to someone. Uh, I looked around and uh, new faces. Um, and I'm a new face to you, too. Uh, so I'm going to make a point of coming up to you and introducing myself and you make a point of coming up to me and introducing yourself. So do that, and I'll, I'll do that, okay? Uh, I'm gonna do this rapid fire, just collapsing this, this is not being rude. Uh, because this is all online, you can go online, and, and it's fantastic reading because some people have done a lot of work in the name of this. Uh, Philippa Kelly, Janice Perrin, Heidi Taylor, Jan Darbyshire, Catelyn Chazinski, Sarah Ekashev, Kelly Kerwin, Sally Olaf, Sarah Stanley, Phaedra Scott, <laughs> Rita Ramanan, Allison Carey, Kate Bredesen, previous recipients. Do read the copy online. It's fantastic. If you have the time, in some cases, as Brian was alluding to, uh, email them, get in touch with them, find out the evolution of what has happened. In the case of, of um, oh my goodness, Sarah, she sent us this amazing uh, follow-up. Uh, uh, um, uh, Cindy can testify to this, about this, this amazing uh, astronomy project that she got involved with, with a Nobel Prize winner, uh, the things that we were uh, funding it was just fantastic uh, about the expansion of the universe. 
to dramaturgs. Put the dramaturgs in the room. We paid to get the dramaturgs in the room with the sign. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at any rate, go online, look at this, follow through, email them, find out more. <laughs> Sorry to be so uh, brief, but I'm trying to be brief. Uh, going on, because I do want to thank uh, a lot of the people in the room. Uh, the adjudication committee, that odd word is so funny. I, 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 uh, it's, a, it's a group of people. I can't begin to thank uh, enough the, the hundreds and hundreds of hours these people have given. Uh, Beth Blicker, former president, uh, I'm sequentially working through this. Jeff Prohl, uh, people always say the dramaturgs of the conscience. Well, my God. <laughs> I'll be dead in 200 years from now. He'll still be talking to me. Uh, you know, hold your own. Why that was such a bad idea? <laughs> but I mean, he's he's uh, he's he's amazing. I I my fondness and admiration for this man, Vicky Stroyd. Um, I'm doing this sequentially. Yvette Nolan, I have such admiration for this person. Jackie Lawton, uh, Ken, my God, such a blessing, <laughs> such a blessing. Uh, uh, Martine, who is, she doesn't know what's in store for her yet. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, I want to make sure I have talked about the administrators who've done a tremendous amount of work. Daniel Carroll, Lindsay Barr this past year, and Jesse Hutchinson, who filled in at a key moment for us. Uh, and then the two people who have shouldered, and Liz Engelman, my God, uh, uh, who has done so much work, so much work, uh, who's been such a partner in crime for me in so many ways over the years on this. And then, but the two people, uh, uh, Brian Quirt, my God. Um, I mean, that nobody will know how much she has given and given and given and articulated uh, and and uh, dealt with my emails and emails endlessly. endlessly. My God, indeed. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, can't thank him enough. But uh, uh, and then I want to talk about Cindy uh, because Cindy. Um, and this gets to something about the philosophy of it. Uh, at one point, a few years, uh, six years ago, I guess it was six years ago, my mother died, and uh, this is Genesis. This is Genesis. Six years ago, my mother died, and it was, uh, well, actually, it was longer ago than that now. Uh, I'd had a heart attack. This is connected to the oxygen. I'd had a heart attack. <laughs> I nearly died. I mean, it was close. Two arteries are 90% full. And I, I was told by my doctors in Houston, I should have died. And they told me, you should have died. I said, why didn't I die? They said, because your heart was in really great shape. <laughs> and uh, uh, I came out of that and uh, thought about a lot of things. My mother was dying at the same time. And I was not allowed by my doctors to go visit her. Mm -hmm. And that was very hard on me. Mm -hmm. And at any rate, I came out of that. I inherited some money, let's be very honest about it. And uh, over the years, I worked very hard as a dramaturg. Everybody knows I worked 80-hour weeks to the point that I did not look good. I looked like Willie Loman most <laughs> of the time with the suitcases on that cover in that book. Uh, so I saved a lot of money, and I inherited some money. And I remember calling up Cindy one summer and saying, I want to, and I'd, there had been a conference that had not gone so well. That's the most charitable way I can put it. And it had gotten back to me. And I said, I called Cindy and I said, Cindy, you know, I was one of the co-founders of this organization a long time ago. And there have been different points along the way this organization nearly died. I mean, in 92, it nearly died. If Jeff Prohl and Mark Lord and some other people in Philadelphia had not revived it. A fact. 
and in 1998 at the University of Puget Sound, the same thing over the rent case had not happened. This organization has many times nearly died. It's very healthy now, but it's nearly died several times. Uh, and uh, I stopped and I called Cindy and said, Cindy, I, uh, I think this organization needs some oxygen and I want to do something about that. And I said, you know, I think it needs an artistic spike. And I want to talk to some key people. I want to talk to you. I don't know what it is yet, but I want to talk. And I got some people on the phone, like Brian and Liz and a few other key people. And we came to an understanding of what it could be. And I didn't quite know what it was. Everybody kept saying, well, what is it? What is it? And I kept saying, I don't know. But these people will help us figure it out. We don't know what it is yet, but it's over the horizon. And I said, I know, what, I know what it isn't. It's not what the NEA grants are. It's not what the TCG grants are. I know, I know what I want the result to be. I want people to do a Linda Blair, you know? <laughs> I, want, I want people to say, a dramaturg did that? That's what I want. And that's what the 16 have been. And our guiding principle in the selection committee and that the people I brought on have all had that at the center of their thinking and their vision. Have all been people I trusted that way. And, and our selection is always, we, 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 oh my God, did we fight sometimes over the phone. Sometimes, and that, that was also part of the selection committee. These were people I knew I could fight with tooth and nail, and we still would come together with good answers. Always, always. At the center, always for me was, I would say, I always believed, my hero, a lot of times, if you, if you were to, when I get most depressed, you know what I do? I live in the upper side, east side of Manhattan. I go to this little place, this little bar, lower part of Manhattan called Marie's Crisis. <laughs> apocryphal tale that that's where Thomas Paine lived and died. Apocryphal, who knows what. And it's a little bar where theater people can go have a really cheap whiskey, five dollars. and. Somebody will sit there behind the bar, this, this place, and play show tunes. And you wander in, have a couple drinks, sing along, and you think maybe Thomas Paine is there, the ghost. Thomas Paine's my hero. Not Washington, not Thomas Jefferson, because he's the one that ignited everything. And I remember Last summer, I went to Philadelphia and I wandered around, bounced around, went to Independence Hall, I went and saw every goddamn thing. Benjamin Frank, every two steps you bump into some fucking thing about Benjamin Frank. <laughs> <laughs> and I kept looking for something about Thomas Paine. Nothing, nothing. I kept looking for the site of where Thomas Paine's common sense was printed. And finally at 10 o'clock, on this lonely street, I found this little sign that said, on this site, common sense was printed. It was the saddest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> and hearing earlier today that group of people talk, and, and, and Amy, you, at the end of this group of people talking about it's really hard, it's really hard, it's really hard saying, yeah, this is, this is, I, this is tough. All I can say is, you know, you could be remembered 200 years later by somebody standing in front of that sign. So that's worth hanging around for. 
And this work matters. This work matters. Tiny last thing. Uh, earlier in the year, uh, I called Brian, uh, Liz. I have a tiny idea about next year. It's still formative, just as six years ago was formative, uh, about celebrating the work of the 16. And that is, in some city, my flying in those 16 for a day-long celebration of you're all gathering, I'm doing this one more time, but in a very, very celebratory way with videos, demonstrations, and then having other experts from other fields come together on panels and everything. And we use it as a recruitment tool in that city. And it wouldn't necessarily be New York. <laughs> because that's kind of boring. <laughs> so we're thinking about that. Yes. Yes. Yes, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Martin. <laughs> uh, so, stay tuned. Okay, I think that's all. <laughs> Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I, I think there may be a lot of new customers at Marie's Crisis <laughs> over the course of the next year. I know I'll be there. Maybe we'll bump into yeah. all of each other there. Um, we partly put this session um, uh, on the first day so that uh, these five projects could be revealed and illuminated and so all of you would have a chance to meet these remarkable people and so that the conversations about their projects, which are clearly ongoing and, and by design and and in the best senses are continuing over into that season so that the conversations that have been generated by these five projects and so that those of you, particularly uh, Mia who spoke to it directly, who needs and wants to engage with, with the people who are here to, to um, uh, um, continue to build uh, your particular project, but so that the ideas of all five of them can uh, reverberate uh, both in both directions for your questions to them and, and their uh, curiosities um, uh, can um, take advantage of the huge uh, brains in this room. Um, so that's why we wanted to put this on the first day, uh, at, at the end of the first day, so that these conversations can continue to reverberate over the course of the next couple days. Uh, and of course, so that we could hear Mark speak um, and to, to really end our day. We're after six, so I think I'm going to close our day on, on Mark's words. Um, with the thought of Marie's crisis uh, in all of our futures. Um, I want to thank Mark enormously once more for the idea that led to all of this. <laughs> to all of those uh, here and elsewhere who have been part of this process so far, and mostly to the five of you for our fantastic projects and great <laughs> Um, and as Coriana comes to the front, which means there's a bit of conference housekeeping to finish our day. Oh.